gaps. The injunction to practice intellectual honesty usually amounts to sabotage of thought. The writer is urged to show explicitly all the steps that have led him to his, inc- to his conclusion, so enabling every reader to follow the process through, and where possible in the academic industry to duplicate it. This demand not only invokes the liberal fiction of the universal communicability of each and every thought, and so inhibits their objectively appropriate expression, but is also wrong in itself as a principle of representation. For the value of a thought is measured by its distance from the continuity of the familiar. It is objectively devalued as this distance is reduced. The more it approximates the more it approximates to the pre-existing standard, the further its antithetical function is diminished, and only in this, in its manifest relation to its opposite, not in its isolated existence, are the claims of thought founded, texts which, anci- which anxiously undertake to record every step without omission inevitably succumb to banality and to a monotony related on- not only to the tension induced in the reader, but to their own substance. Simmel's writings, for example, are all vitiated by the incompatibility of their out-of-the-ordinary subject matter with its painfully lucid treatment. They show the recondite to be the true complement of mediocrity, which Simmel wrongly believed Goethe's secret. But quite apart from this, the demand for intellectual honesty is itself dishonest, even if we were for once to comply with the questionable directive that the exposition should exactly reproduce the process of thought, this process would be no more a discursive progression from stage to stage than conversely, knowledge falls from heaven. Rather, knowledge comes to us through a network of prejudices, opinions, innervations, self-corrections, presuppositions, and exaggerations. In short, through the dense, firmly founded, but by no means uniformly transparent medium of experience. Of this, the Cartesian rule that we must address ourselves only to objects to gain clear and indubitable knowledge of which our minds seem sufficient, with all the order and disposition to which the rule refers, gives as false a picture as the opposed but deeply related doctrine of the intuition of essences. If the latter denies logic its rights, which in spite of everything assert themselves in every thought, the former takes logic in its immediacy in relation to each single intellectual act and not as mediated by the whole flow of conscious life in the knowing subject. But in this lies also an admission of profound inadequacy, for if honest ideas unfailingly boil down to mere repetition, whether of what was there beforehand or of categorical forms, then the thought which, for the sake of the relation to its object, forgoes the full transparency of its logical genesis, will always incur a certain guilt. It breaks the promise presupposed by the very form of judgment. This inadequacy resembles that of life, which describes a wavering, deviating line, disappointing by comparison with its premises, and yet which only in this actual course always less than it should be is able, under given conditions of existence, to represent an unrent an unregimented one. If a life fulfilled its vocation directly, it would miss it. Anyone who died old and in the consciousness of seemingly blameless success would secretly be the model schoolboy who reels off all life stages without gaps or omissions, an invisible satchel on his back. Every thought which is not idle, however, bears branded on it the impossibility of its full legitimation, as we know in dreams that there are mathematics lessons missed for the sake of a blissful morning in bed, which can never be made up. Thought waits to be woken one day by the memory of which or of what has been missed and to be transformed into teaching.